Hello everyone and welcome to this press briefing by Climate Action Network. CAN is a network of over 1,500 civil society organizations in over 130 countries. Today, midweek through week two, we see things picking up at COP26, but questions remain on whether this COP is truly moving the right direction to respond to the climate emergency, to support, deliver support to those already experiencing unavoidable impacts and loss and damage, and on phasing out all fossil fuels. Uh, we are joined by our speakers today from across the network and partner organizations. We have Teresa Anderson, Climate Policy Coordinator at ActionAid International. We have Mohamed Ado, Director, PowerShift Africa. We have Zipporah Berman, Chair of the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty Initiative and International Program Director at Stand Earth. And we have Pasco Sabido, Researcher and Campaigner at Corporate Europe Observatory. We will have opening remarks from each of them and then we will take questions uh, from media. Uh, I would also like to urge observers in the room if there are media waiting outside to consider giving up your seats so we can have media enter the room. I will now hand it over to Teresa to start us off. Thank you, Darini. So I would like to remind all of us that we're still in the middle of a pandemic Global South countries have seen how fine words of solidarity have actually meant nothing when it comes to providing real support to, our, to find our way through this crisis. We have to learn the lesson and make sure that rich countries don't turn their backs on the rest of the world yet again. So as you all know, there's been a new text, a new cover decision text come out today, and we're going to talk a little bit about that now. When it comes to loss and damage in particular, let's note that the mood, mood, mood music around the issue of loss and damage has been significantly different at this COP. Finally, the message that the citizens of Scotland, the UK, Europe and uh, other developed countries actually care about their sisters and brothers on the front lines of the climate crisis in, uh, and do not want to leave them to deal with the problem on their own is getting through. And governments are responding to that message. You know, there's now a reference to loss and damage appearing in the final, in, sorry, in the draft decision text. Um, and the UNFCCC is finally recognizing that communities dealing with the heartbreaking challenges of rebuilding and recovering after climate disasters need the world's support to do so. But if you look at the text, it includes language of acknowledgement, re uh, reiteration, welcoming, even some urging, but this is typical UN fluff. It doesn't actually create a new mechanism to address the, the crisis. These are just words. When it comes down to it, they will make no difference to the communities, to the smallholder farmers, to the women and girls in the global south. This text will still not do anything for those who are being hardest hit by deadly flooding, cyclones, droughts, rising sea levels, and crop failures. This is yet more empty rhetoric. Saying it's urgent means nothing without the commitment to act. And if COP26 doesn't match its recognition of urgency with real action to address it and to meet the needs of the people on the front lines of the crisis, then it will be an empty vessel. It's a text that creates the, uh, well, a text that creates the illusion of action is arguably worse than no text at all. We are really sick of this pretense. Why do they continue to sit on their hands when they know the devastation that's on its way? And this insufficient delivery of real support for those impacted is particularly worrying alongside the fine words but insufficient action on fossil fuels and mitigation. It is really significant that for the first time ever, fossil fuels and subsidies have been referenced, albeit in an insufficient way. This is a major move that does need to be built on. They didn't get it right the first time though. So they do need to go back and make it really do the job by referencing all fossil fuels, not just coal, and by recognizing equity, by demanding more of the biggest polluters and linking the call to action with increased climate finance for developing countries. Otherwise, they will really struggle to make those transformations. However, the new text at COP26 contains a dangerous assumption that net zero climate targets are both necessary and sufficient for achieving the 1.5 degree goal. Net zero is a myth that as is being used by polluters and governments to lure us into a false sense of security that the climate crisis is being addressed. 
The net in net zero allows for dangerous and unachievable amounts of carbon offsets in climate targets, which drive land grabs and human rights abuses in the global south. Meanwhile, net zero by 2050 targets disguise climate inaction for decades. If you scratch the surface of a net zero target, you'll likely search in vain for the radical systemic transformation in our energy, food, transport and industrial systems that are so urgently needed to ensure a livable planet. The text does talk about escalating climate action to meet the 1.5 target, but the maths of this paper just does not add up. We saw from yesterday's analysis by Climate Action Tracker that the world is heading towards at least 2.4 degrees of warming due to empty net zero targets that are paying lip service to climate action. The fact is we must choose between net zero targets and the 1.5 degree goal because we cannot have both. In conclusion, where is the support to help people forced to pick up the pieces from climate disasters? Where is the action to meet all of this urgency? And where are the real commitments that the world needs to limit warming to 1.5 or to back up the need for action with climate finance? With this text, our leaders are still failing us. These empty words are way off target to meet the scale of the enormous challenge facing humanity. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. First in first, the text that have been produced by the presidency isn't good enough. The texts are lopsided. On one side of the scale, there's lots, on, lots of processes on emissions reductions, but not much to foster solidarity and fairness. For the first time, we now have a COP text that explicitly calls for the phasing out of coal and fossil fuel subsidies. And that is welcome step that this process has now taken. Why is this progress? And I'll tell you two things. And, and firstly, it's fossil fuels that causes climate change. And so explicitly mentioning it means that we're now getting on the path to addressing it. But secondly, both the Convention and the Paris Agreement haven't mentioned the elephant in the room. And so for the first time in 30 years, we're able to actually get it in a formal legal text in a draft form. So our task now is A, to protect that text, but B, to strengthen it by making it happen faster, but also in an equitable manner. And that is the way we will land it. So what we need to do is actually make the face out of coal, oil, and gas fast and equitable. But on the key demands of the vulnerable countries, I'm sad to say that there is very little in this text. And I'll start on what is needed to help the vulnerables adapt to climate change. You don't have clear target, i.e. a global goal and adaptation. You don't have comparable process and events, including the high-level roundtables that have been set up for mitigation to help the world prepare for the inevitable impact of climate change. Neither do you have clear processes to help the world deal with losses and damages. So that part of the text is very fuzzy and vague. And so that needs to be addressed so that we can be able to deliver a balanced and ambitious outcome. And it is in our interest to ensure we have a comprehensive pact going out of Glasgow so that we can be able to effectively tackle the climate emergency. So you can do that by only advancing one part of the equation and neglecting the other. So we are in a multilateral process, and the only times we've had successes out of these negotiations is when we've dealt with a full details of the negotiations, not just mitigation, but ad together with adaptation, finance, and loss and damage. And that is not there yet. We're, we have a text that fails to mention that the, the developed countries have failed to deliver the 100 billion. So there is no acknowledgment of the failure to mobilize the climate finance that they promised. The text misses also the opportunity to actually address how they will actually address the shortfall in delivering the 100 billion. It also fails to set out a clear logical process on how support is going to be mobilized to help put the world on the 1.5 trajectory. 
So you can have good rhetoric on emissions reductions, including processes that are likely talk shops. But if you don't actually acknowledge the failure to actually honor the past promises, you will actually be damaging trust. What we need moving forward is to actually forge international cooperation, not just for emissions reductions, but also to mobilize the much needed support to help put the world on a 1.5 trajectory. But we know we will fail, and we will still have to deal with inevitable impacts, which is why it's important for this process to actually put forward a clear work program that will, will include invitations to go into, out to the parties to define a global goal on adaptation, but more importantly on how we will mobilize the resources that will help the world deal with adaptation, but also loss and damage. So we can't have text that are silent on support. We can't have texts that are silent on adaptation. We can't have texts that are silent on the support for loss and damage. And I think what we need to do now is actually help make the text balanced and then strengthen the emissions reductions commitments that are contained there, but to help deliver them, lift up the support that the vulnerable countries require to help, help them deliver on the emissions cuts that have been included in the text. Thank you, Mohammed. As Mohammed noted, COP after COP has, um, has seen fossil fuels, um, in COP after COP we have seen fossil fuels uh, invisible. Yet we know that 86% of the emissions trapped in our atmosphere come from three products, oil, gas, and coal. And today we're still spending the majority of our intellectual, our financial, and our political capital to dig up stuff that we know we can't burn or it will burn us. In this COP, we've seen some breakthroughs. We're finally having the conversation about fossil fuels. We've seen some game-changing announcements, commitments by countries to end financing, 25 countries to end financing of overseas uh, investment in fossil fuel production. But what are these countries doing at home? We've seen some statements, as Mohammed noted, in the text, but only about coal. It's time. Many of us have said many F words at COP. It's time to say some particular F words at COP. Fossil fuels, phasing them out, fast, fair, and forever. We've now come to a breaking point in the implementation of the Paris Agreement. We cannot meet the goals of the Paris Agreement unless, uh, unless we address the expansion of oil, gas, and coal. The science is very clear. The UN Production Gap Report notes that we are on track to produce 110% more oil, gas, and coal in the next decade than we could ever burn in a 1.5 degree scenario. So it's past time to move from rhetoric to substantial policy and commitments to stop funding, to stop subsidizing, to stop approving the expansion of fossil fuels. So in specific, in the public finance commitment last week, over 25 countries to end their international finance of oil and gas, including some surprise joiners like Canada and the United States. This is very welcome. However, that only focused on ending these countries' international finance and not their domestic financing of fossil fuels. In effect, we're seeing countries saying that they're going to stop giving other countries money to produce coal, oil, and gas, but they're not going to stop funding their own production of them. So there is still, still significant progress to be, made, to be made. The acid test of COP's success, will progress be reflected in or undermined by the final agreement? As we turn to week two, the question is how the commitments made in week one will be reflected in the decision text that describes to the world what governments achieved at Glasgow. This year, we are seeing countries proactively asking for energy transition and fossil fuel phase out to be included in the cover text. And unfortunately, in the first draft version of that text, the non-paper that the UK presidency released over the weekend, it missed this request by failing to include any language of it. That's no surprise, given that the UK presidency has approved the Cambo oil field during their presidency. More oil when the IPCC science, the UNEP production gap report, shows that this is completely inconsistent with meeting our 1.5 degree goals. 
So of course, they don't want it in the text, and now they've produced a text that only mentions coal and not oil and gas. We also did see the first ever reference to subsidies that must be defended in the coming days. The IMF report last month reports that our countries around the world subsidize the oil, gas, and coal industry $11 million a minute. The transition will not be easy, but we know that wealthy countries must act first. In order to ensure a transition, we need international cooperation, and that's why over 900 organizations, 101 Nobel laureates, including the Dalai Lama, over 2,500 scientists and ac academics, major cities from around the world, and today 150 parliamentarians from 31 countries are endorsing the principles of a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty to ensure international cooperation on who gets to produce and how much, and how do we do that in a fair and equitable way. We need to shift back to a strong multilateral agreement on climate and fossil fuels. We've gone from hard policies under Kyoto to soft pledges under Paris to Boris Johnson's press releases at Glasgow. The real test of credibility for this COP is for the final COP26 decision text to reflect the commitments that have been made on fossil fuels and include language on energy transition and the phasing out and stopping the expansion of oil, gas, and coal. The creation of the Beyond Oil and Gas Alliance is an important development as the first diplomatic initiative that focuses on stopping the expansion of oil, gas, and coal and managing a phase out of fossil fuel production. We urge more countries and subnational actors to join this initiative to create momentum towards ending the expansion. The BOGA press conference hosted by Costa Rica and Denmark will launch tomorrow in the Giants Causeway at 1245. The countries here claim we're in a transition. It's simply not a transition if we continue to grow the problem. We know the transition will be difficult, but we're making it more difficult every day if we continue to grow the problem. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, thank you. Um, so yeah, I guess I was just going to touch on, we released some research on Monday uh, with corporate accountability, Glasgow calls out polluters and global witness, showing there are more than 500 fossil fuel lobbyists walking these halls at COP26. So that's more than double the number of indigenous delegates. Uh, and if the fossil fuel industry was a country here, it would be the biggest by far. Um, but actually many countries have also brought the fossil fuel industry into these talks. Canada, in particular, brought two representatives from Suncor, based in Alberta, a tar sands company. Um, they brought in the senior vice president, Martha Hall Findlay, a previously twice elected MP in Canada, uh, who even stood for leadership and lost to Justin Trudeau. But in the build up to COP, Shell and BP have said how unwelcome they feel. Uh, they're not going to attend these talks. But yet, um, our research shows they are clearly still here in force, just like previous years, in part thanks to their membership of their many fossil fuel lobby associations. So Shell has at least eight people here, um, including David Hone, who was due to speak at the International Emissions Trading Association yesterday before pulling out in face of protest. BP has seven registered people. Um, and it used an event here at the World Business Council for Sustainable Development to call for even more involvement in these talks, even more than it has already. And Equinor, the Norwegian state oil and gas company, is here with seven people. Perhaps the most prominent person on its delegation is one Amber Rudd, who is chair of Equinor's UK International Advisory Group. So until September 2019, she was a cabinet minister under Prime Minister Johnson and previously served as Secretary of State for Climate and Energy, but in 2020 went through the revolving door and joined Equinor. So Equinor claims that its international advisory group members do not represent the company, yet Rudd has been publicly speaking on behalf of Equinor in the build-up to COP and is here registered uh, under its name as part of the Global Wind Energy Council. Um, this shows you how fossil fuel interests do manage to get into these talks. She can use her connections with ex-colleagues, her know-how, that little black book, to ensure Equinor's interests are heard, such as promoting carbon capture and storage and hydrogen, uh, which, are both, which are both in the draft Article 6 proposals for non-market mechanisms. And maybe it's a coincidence, but Equinor is now getting public money to build new CCS and fossil hydrogen plants in the northeast of England and Scotland. 
So revolving door, uh, the revolving door is highly problematic and a key way for big oil and gas to keep influencing climate policy, uh, both at national and international level. And the research from the Fossil Free Politics Coalition, I have a little sticker here, um, looked at six of Europe's biggest oil and gas majors uh, and found that there were more than 70 revolving door cases from COP21 until now. Um, and that influence plays out in the negotiations. By strong promotion of fossil fuel favourites, such as the loophole of net zero, um, we all know it is still a big con. We produced a report on it just in the run-up to COP. Um, but the UK government, unfortunately, has put it front and centre of both its announcements and its press releases, as well as what it's pushing for on the inside. But we're also hearing, as we heard, coal is in the text. Um, but we've seen a big push from the Global North to not include oil and gas. Why is oil and gas not in there? In part because the oil and gas industry, well, it threw coal under the bus long, a long time ago uh, before the Paris COP21 climate talks in order to present itself as the clean fossil fuel. So this is why we're seeing coal mentioned, but not, uh, not oil and gas, which is against the interests of many Global North oil and gas companies. Um, and if we're serious about keeping fossil fuels in the ground and we want to keep temperatures below 1.5 degrees, which is the stated aim here, then we really need to be keeping big polluters as far away from these talks as possible. We've done it with the tobacco industry and public health, so we need to do it now with the fossil fuel industry and other big polluters, because quite honestly, those trying to burn down the table should not have a seat at it. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks everyone for those opening remarks. We can now take questions. We have about nine minutes for questions, so we'll take two at a time. We prioritize questions from media, so please introduce yourselves. Uh, yes, very straightforward question. In your view... Can you please introduce yourself? I do apologise. I'm Alex Thompson from Channel 4 News in the UK. Very straightforward question, pretty obvious one. In your view, does, does the statement as it stands at the moment deliver Paris and 1.5 or not? No, sadly it doesn't. Uh, what you need to look at is uh, emissions reductions commitment that countries included in the indices. Uh, we're currently on course to 2.4 degrees of warming, as you know, has been assessed by the carbon, uh, carbon tracker. And the commitment that countries have included uh, in the current text doesn't include the support to even deliver the indices, majority of which are conditional on support, particularly from the developing countries. So if we want to get the world on a 1.5 trajectory, we need to see countries enhance their emissions reductions don't just face out coal, but actually face out coal, oil, and gas, and do it fast and do it in a manner that is fair, and then deliver the solidarity through forging international cooperation so that we can mobilize the financial and technological resources that will help us actually achieve those uh, targets. And none of that stuff is currently included in the text. They fail to deliver the 100 billion, they don't even acknowledge that in the text. Neither do they set a process that will help mobilize the much needed trillions that will help the world deliver the 1.5. So we're far away from the rhetoric of keeping 1.5 alive. You don't do that through text, you do that through commitments and real world actions. Thank you. Any further questions or comments from the panel on the same question? Maybe just to say that from a political perspective, to, to get a deal that will bring, um, bring this deal home, that will, will get, um, help us meet the, the 1.5 target, we need to meet the needs of all countries and meeting all needs of all countries. It needs to, this text can't be unbalanced. It can't be focused on pushing countries to do unachievable mitigation, uh, to achieve, un, uh, to have un unachievable mitigation expectations without the support that they need, um, either for transitioning to gre greener pathways or for coping with climate impacts. Um, it has to be a full package, um, and we're not there yet. Yeah. Thank you. We have a question from Megan, and then we'll take two at a time. Megan Rowling from Thomson Reuters Foundation. So like you say, this is lopsided, um, the text so far. Um, do you know what things are actually still being discussed by, by the ministers that could actually make it into this text, because 
clearly it's not going to satisfy the Climate Vulnerable Forum, AOSIS, High Ambition Coalition and others, and there's a placeholder, for example, on loss and damage, etc. Can you fill us in on that, please? Thanks, Megan. We'll take the other question as well. From uh, I'm, I was a very similar question. <laughs> I'm also from Thompson Reuters Foundation, Laurie Gearing. I'm, I was just curious, you know, who you see. Do you see in the final hours of this thing uh, these groupings staying here and agreeing to this, or do you see people walking out as the not, not having a, a decision? So the text we have now isn't good enough. Let's just acknowledge that. To help make it good, what we need to see a real movement, particularly from the UK, the EU, and the US on climate finance. That includes them doubling their share of adaptation finance, setting out a clear process, including a target for loss and damage finance and how that is going to be delivered. And then thirdly, honoring the 100 billion that they promised the world in 2009. If they acknowledged the shortfall in delivering the 100 billion, included a clear commitment on how they will make the shortfall so that between now and when the long-term climate finance is agreed, the cumulative total of climate finance is going to be the 100 billion per year all the way to 2024 so that we have the 500 billion honored. But you know, that is far short of what developing countries require to be able to deliver their current Paris NDCs. And so agreeing a clear process that will help the world identify a quantitative climate finance target that is going to be co uh, you know, a collective one that they will all work towards is going to actually go a long way in restoring confidence in this process. In the absence of that, it's hard to see how these texts can actually be agreed. There are some bits and some important hooks that need to be protected. One such hook is the inclusion of the target to face out coal. We've never had that in the 30 years of negotiations. We want that strength, strengthened by including oil and gas. We want that strengthened by including the date by when they will do that and how they will support those developing countries whose economies are dependent on oil and gas and coal. Secondly, and I think importantly, is how we will collectively identify a global goal on adaptation. You have a placeholder now, and I assume you have a placeholder now because you have the ministerial consultations going on. So we want to see those consultations concluded so that we have balance in the text, so that we don't have a mitigation-centric text coming out of Glasgow, but you have good enough text that of vast confidence, particularly to the climate vulnerables, on how they will be supported to deal with adaptation, how they will be supported to deal with loss and damage, and how we will collectively help shift the trillions that will allow us to deliver the actions that are needed to put, help achieve 1.5. So the text we have now doesn't deliver any of that. It starts the negotiations, and so the actual deal making is only going to begin from now. Thanks, Mabad. Sporo. Uh, Thank you. I want to make um, one comment to make something uh, explicit, which I think is implicit. By refusing to include oil and gas in the text, uh, our, our countries are essentially saying that they're leaving it up to the marketplace uh, to decide how much gets to produce gets to be produced. We already have enough oil, gas, and coal under production or construction on the planet to take us past two degrees. So the fact is that if we leave it, we, at this moment in history, we cannot allow the marketplace to decide the fate of humanity. It means an unmanaged decline versus a managed decline, and more people will suffer. If our governments are truly committed to a just transition, then they have to plan for that transition. If we plan for the transition, then workers and their families will be kept whole. Then we will make sure that we address equity and justice that is not being addressed by the marketplace on who gets to produce what and how much. That's why these words need to be in the text, and that's why our governments have to get serious 
about not just addressing emissions, but finally addressing the production of oil, gas, and coal, because we have to stop the expansion. The theory was that the marketplace would do that if demand goes down and the price goes up. It's not working. It's not working fast enough to keep us safe. We've seen that rich countries mouth fair words in public, but behind the scenes they do the exact opposite. And there is real anger and frustration at this two-facedness. Uh, there are real efforts to trade away peanuts in order to get away with doing the bare minimum, um, even though we're in the middle of a crisis. So we can't let this veneer of action run the risk of placating the public, placating parties, because otherwise we will wake up here, wake up in the weeks after COP, realizing that historic opportunity has been missed. Thank you, everyone. We are at the end of our time, so we have to close here, but our speakers are available for follow-up questions, and we will have another press briefing here tomorrow. Thanks, everyone.